and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled that you are here to join us today. We're going to be talking today about the revolutionizing treatment of neurodegenerative disease and how it is giving new hope to Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Now, if you're new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to have real conversations with real people, and maybe you can be our next guest. We talk with people all around the world, from those diagnosed to families and professionals that care, all kinds of businesses, uh, services, products, tools, authors, musicians, singers, songwriters, movie directors, and of course, our researchers and our advocates out there. So uh, if that's something of interest, email me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. I would love to hear from you. And I'm going to do a couple of shout outs before I actually introduce our guest. One, I'm really excited. My book, Betty the Bald Chicken, Lessons in How to Care is going to be published uh, shortly. I'm just waiting on the final proof and um, it will be available, but we are taking pre-orders and you can find that by going to alzheimerspeaks.com and just click on the book tab. In addition, on our site, you will find one whole section of free educational resources. So please check that out. Not only can you access the radio shows and dementia chats and dementia in the arts, but you can learn about memory cafes and dementia friendly communities and the purple angel project. And of course, um, we also have people that submit poetry and articles there. That's quite fascinating. And you can, uh, you can uh, find out information about our blog and then dementia map, which is a global resource directory that you are definitely going to want to check out. We have over 150 different categories that you can search. There's an events calendar and so much more. Okay, so let me introduce you to our guest today. I am really excited because again, we're going to be talking about new hope for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative um, diseases as well. And I am just so honored to talk with Mark Giroux, who is the founder and CEO of Curve Therapeutics, which is a kind of a next generation med tech company on a mission to provide treatments for Alzheimer's disease and other neurological disorders. Mark is a 20 year medical industry veteran who invented Curves, which is a patented technology. And right now there's over 35 human use clinical trials going on. So I can't wait to learn more about this. So Mark, I'm so excited to have you here. I love talking with researchers and learning what is going on. And I know, uh, you know, our audience is, you know, clamoring for more information because there's been a few, a few very public defeats out there when it comes to, to treatment and trials and what the heck is going on. But before we kind of dive down that alley, I always like to ask all my guests if they've been personally touched with their own family members or circle of friends with a form of dementia. Um, It's wonderful to be here with you, Lori. And yes, uh, my father had it. His five sisters had it. His five sisters all died of it, not recognizing anybody. But, you know, our technology was not at a point where we could have really helped them. But it had matured to the point where I could um, help my help my father. He was the youngest of all of them by a considerable margin. I think he was an uncle by the time he was seven. So um, we had he fit the window of our success a little better than his older sisters did. Um, but uh, we put him on the technology when he first got diagnosed, and that was more than ten years ago. And uh, nine years in, he. Um, 
was declared asymptomatic of Alzheimer's. He was di- he was diagnosed as mild cognitive impaired, uh, which is you know where everybody starts. And we were watching for it because of the family history, and it was just uh, something that we could do when we were targeting. So we got him on the technology within nine months. He was con- he was considered asymptomatic. They took him off everything else, and he remained asymptomatic until he had his fatal heart attack. So. Um, you know, his five sisters died of Alzheimer's. He did not. Um, and, you know, he was coherent throughout the entire process. He recognized everybody, still played his football pools and all of those things and, and stayed engaged. So uh, it was really gratifying to see. And that was one of the early uh, earlier successes that we had among many, which we can talk about, at, at, you know, maybe later in the in the broadcast. But my personal touching of it was. Uh, yeah, my father had it. We knew he was going to get it. And, uh, you know, as if anybody has uh, family members who have it, you're genetically predisposed to be a higher risk for it. So we want to make sure people understand that. And early detection and early diagnosis is, is a key to that. So um, that that's a big part of what we're doing right now. Wow. Within nine months, that's incredible um, to be able to see that that type of difference. And that does that weigh on you that your dad and his five sisters all ha- had that? Um, or or do you kind of just brush that off and, and live your day-to-day life? Oh, no, absolutely a weighs on you. Uh, it's a devastating uh, diagnosis, right? Because, you know, most patients who get told that, you know, you have all times your stage one or stage two, and this is, you know, because people don't notice it or they're trying to ignore it uh, as things happen. But um, uh, because he had it, I have what I consider to be an extraordinarily good memory. It's not eidetic, you know, it's not a photographic mm-hmm. memory, but it's extraordinarily good. And I lean on it a lot in my day-to-day life, both business and personal. So I just declared to myself when I turned 50 that I am not ever going to get it and started using the technology myself um, so that I would never get a symptom. And, you know, that's that was 10 years ago. So I am still <laughs> symptom-free, and that's how we hope to, to, to keep it. Um, I, my wife is a little bit older than me. She has started using it as well. And so I have her 90 year old parents. So we're, um, you know, we're, we're sharing the love of what it is that's possible here. And big reason why we wanted to talk to you is to let everybody else know that this is possible for them as well. Wow. Talk about all in the family. I, you know, I love that it's not, you know, you can do this but I'm not going to do that, you know, because I mean, you're, you're all in with this thing <laughs> in, in terms of your comfort level. And, and to me, that says a lot. Let's, let's talk first about the mission that you have for Curves Therapeutics. How did, how did that start? And when did that start for you? Well, it started quite a while ago um, because, you know, we were, you know, the, the genesis of the technology was chronic sinusitis. I've had five sinus surgeries and I really can't get any more. But the biggest problem with chronic sinusitis is getting medicine to the place in the nasal cavity where you need to get it. So I was simply trying to cure myself just to come up with a a treatment that I could do for myself. But what that included was getting drugs to parts of the nasal cavity that were impossible to reach with the current technology. Um, And when I first started looking into it, it was difficult to do. And it was daunting at what you had to overcome. Um, But, um, you know, by being able to treat chronic sinusitis, the nose to brain people called up and they said, you know, look, we need to get drugs here. Can you do that? And we'd already figured out how to do that. So we said, sure. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, We had to fine tune the technology to get it to go mostly in those areas instead of other areas. Uh, But we succeeded at that. So the very first trial we did was for Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment, and it worked. Um, So we were getting a good amount of the drug into the brain through the nasal cavity, and it was having a biomarker effect on the patients. Uh, so we then that was phase one, then we went to phase two and then to phase two B. So, you know, the idea that we were doing it for something else and the serendipity of this was the central nervous system 
was just a wonderful happenstance, right? Uh, and it, be, it became the central core of our business. So pretty much anybody who has the central nervous system disorder can be helped by us. Um, so whether it's Parkinson's or ALS or PTSD, we are working with soldiers who have PTSD um, with uh, firms in the Northeast, and we're trying to, to expand that. We'll work with the Army on traumatic brain injury. Um, but the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for us is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because we have the most data there. And we're one clinical trial away from being able to offer this to everybody. So, you know, that's where we are right now. But, the, you know, the neurodegenerative disease market came to us. We were just trying to tell everybody, hey, look how cool we are. We have access to the nasal cavity that other people don't. And they, they called us up and said, do this for us and, and you'll be successful. And we did. And it was, and it was just a, it's been a terrific journey so far because, you know, I get to interact with patients every day and they're caregivers and we know what they struggle against and what the patient's anxieties are. And, um, you know, once they have their machine and it's showing them good results, uh, they're very protective of it. And if it ever malfunctions, they call us up right away. We say, okay, uh, sometimes it just means it's empty. Replace your medicine vial and you'll be fine. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that they have such an emotional attachment to it tells you, um, you know, how they feel about what they're getting. Um, so it's uh, neurodegenerative diseases found us. Um, but we embraced it because we actually can. And that's part of our mission is we do this because we can and because we have to. What are we supposed to say? I'm sorry, Alzheimer's patients. I'm going to make more money doing chronic sinusitis than treating you. So you're going to have to die because, um, you know, it's a money thing. That's how big pharma works. So we don't want to do that. So we pretty much have chronic sinusitis on the sideline while we try to help people who have a completely unmet need and is 100 percent terminal. And it doesn't uh, have to be. Well, I, I love hearing all this. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the, the technology and how your Curves technology differs from so much that's out there right now? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, and it, when I first started, uh, I, I thought I had it figured out. I went into the clinic. And after doing about, I don't know, 14 months of research, well, I actually, I did two months of research, thought I had it figured out, went into the clinic and found out I did not have it figured out. Had to do about another year's worth of research to find out what it is I had to overcome. And it was daunting because, you know, you have the anatomy, you have air flows, you have air pressures. So what I realized was that the problem wasn't chemical or anatomical. The drugs actually for chronic sinusitis were fine. They just never got where they needed to get. So we needed to be able to find a better way of delivering it. So um, what am I what what are the conditions I need to change? And it turns out that, you know, the ambient air around you is not it does not carry the same pressure as the air inside your head. So if you ever want to experiment with it, take a spray bottle, squirt it up your nose, but hold your breath the whole time. It's going to and come right back down and drip all over your face because the air pressure keeps it out. So we have to make sure the patient breathes in. When they breathe in, we have to then make the droplets behave. And they have to take corners. They have to take multiple corners to get where they need to get. And it turned out that there are four cre uh, critical to function features of how can we make this technology work? And it was uh, the, the spray bottles did giant droplets that mostly gravity affected and you swallow 90% of it. Um, so we had to have much smaller droplets, but we had to control those droplets. Um, exit velocity played a big role, how fast they're gonna come out. Um, and uh, turbulent flow is how they take corners. Uh, and atomization rate. We can deliver the drug in, in half a second or 25 seconds. It depends on what it is we're trying to do. So it, what it required was an electric pump and um, electronic controls. And now we have that all figured out. It took, you know, seven or eight years of R&D and millions of dollars to come to this conclusion. But you end up with a device that's only this big um, fits in your breast pocket is I can make it disappear in my hand and it does all of these things. So what we're looking to do is put that in everybody's, everybody's hands and it's all built in. So the turbulent flow, the atomization rate, droplet size and all of that, um, exit velocity is pre-programmed. The patient simply picks it up, presses a button, breathes normally, does it in both nostrils. Um, we have some 
Alzheimer's drugs that take a minute and a half, and we have some that take less than a minute. But you're looking at one to three minutes a day to treat your dementia or your cognitive impairment, whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or what have you. Uh, it's a very, very user-friendly uh, device, and it's odorless, tasteless, and painless. You don't know anything is happening, really while you're doing it because the droplet sizes are so small. So what we want to be able to do is give a patient something where they don't have to do anything. They don't have to figure anything out. They don't have, there's, no, there's no real big learning curve. You pick the device up, you put it in your nostril, you push the button, and that's it. And then the whole machine goes back in the refrigerator and you walk away. Um, and we've had Parkinson's patients who have their, their – um, uh, symptoms resolve completely where there were tremors and they couldn't walk. They were always falling down. That patient plays tennis now, drives his car and he's back to work. The changes are spectacular. And most of this data is documented and in the public domain. Biggest problem we have with big pharma is they like to solve things with chemistry and we're doing it with physics, not something they get very well. They're coming around because as you mentioned, there was a bunch of big high profile defeats that instead of doing it through an infusion, they could have put it in our device and made it a lot safer and a lot more effective. And we're still we're still trying to break down some of those doors, but they're actually starting to open for us now. Um, but for our purposes for right now and helping the, um, the Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers is we have to get the clinical trials done. So we have one more trial to run and, uh, you know, we need some help doing that. Wow, that is so interesting. When you were saying, you know, kind of the, the four critical things, I was thinking, oh, I hope we don't have to analyze that at our end and stuff, but it's just so easy and you just push a button and then to have it be odorless and tasteless and painless, because a lot of times with those sprays, you get an aftertaste or it's uncomfortable or the numbers of times you have to do it and and things, you know, how you broke it down just makes so much sense. When the drops are too big, they're not going to be able to forge forward. And um, you've got to have um, you've got to have that fast, quick pace to, like you said, get around the corners and be able to maneuver and the power behind it. I mean, it just it just sounds like, well, why why wasn't this done like years and years and years ago? You know, um, yeah. And it could have been, um, you know, uh, Big Pharma, like I said, likes to do things with chemistry. They're realizing that they can't do it like that very well. Um, that one high profile um, failure, um, you know, we get 3000 percent more into the brain using our technology than an infusion does. So that's that's what's called tremendous dose flexibility. Instead of having a toxic dose that was causing all the brain bleeds that was making everybody nervous, we could have cut that dose in half, got better if, uh, efficacy in the patient while making it infinitely safer. And we're still considering doing that with that drug, um, provided we could get permission. Um, but it, it's it's one of the things where they keep searching for an answer that already exists, and it would be easy. Um but coming up with those four uh, areas of study uh, was actually kind of fun because I went into a, a doctor's office, an a, a ear, nose, and throat doctor, and he took a look at what I wanted to do, and he just said, anatomically impossible, you're wasting your time. And, you know, that was the end of the meeting. Um, so I came back, and he said, it was a fluke. I came back. I said, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And he said, all right, you may be onto something. Um a lot, of, a lot of gratification to someone telling you something's impossible and you do it anyway. Um, oh, well, and, I, you know, those are the roadblocks that we run against instead of just checking it out and pushing forward, um, using some of these old paths over and over and over and over again. Um, you know, billions of dollars have been spent on, on processes and by multiple companies trying to do stuff the same, the same old way. Uh, I just think of the, the cost difference and the, the um the quality of life the you know not so inconvenient you know you don't have to go to the hospital to get an infusion i mean all those steps um they take time they take money um and they take to me they take away quality of life unless there's really something at the end of the rainbow there and you have delivered something that uh seems to be uh you know much much easier 
uh, for people to do. For those of you that are just joining us right now, we're talking with uh, Mark Giroux, who is the founder of Curve, and he is really changing how we can treat Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases here. You can always go to their website at curvetx.com, and they are also on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Well, let's keep going with this. I just find this so fascinating. It's, it's nice to hear hopeful stories um, because there's been so much negative energy in, in some of the rabbit hole treatments that have gone out and, you know, were they ethically done? And I mean, you can go on and on and on and on um, with that. And I don't, I don't want to focus on the negative. I, I love to focus on this hope. Um, you had said your family had been, you know, affected by this disease and you talked a little bit about, you know, it's in the back of your mind. Do you have brothers and sisters or, you know, nieces and nephews and stuff? And what are, what are their thoughts about the disease as a whole and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, both my younger brother who um, recently passed of a heart attack, which was a shame, but mm -hmm. um, my sister is on it as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there really isn't anybody, a uh, familial acquaintance or total stranger who once you at, tell them what it is you're doing, anybody over 50 says, I want one of those. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, interestingly enough, we ran a cognition in diabetics because with Harvard Medical School, we ran a phase two study. And what it turned out is that diabetics end up with cognitive impairment as at a much younger age than than people without diabetes. Um, and what we found was the control group was just normals over 50, right? People like you and me, we don't have diabetes, but we have, um, you know, we, we are worried about our cognitive, uh, you know, future. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out the control group actually regained cognitive abilities they'd lost. They, te they tested better coming out than going in. So just normals over 50 it had better verbal fluency, short term memory and attention span, simply because aging causes cognitive decline. And it's not necessarily a disease. It's just, you know, you have trouble finding a word. You can't think of, you know, someone, you know, uh, small things. Why did I walk in this room? Um, those things can go away. And uh, it's not that expensive. Um, the one the one we were talking about uh, recently with. Um, you know, the ex incredible expense, um, we did a calculation. It was $10,000 a month to do the infusion. And you have to have killer insurance who's going to pay for that. Otherwise, that's a lot of out of pocket. Um, but if you put it in our device, it was $350 a month, much more affordable. It's just a huge savings due to the efficiency of the technology. So part of what we face as a challenge in many cases is it's too good to be true. All right, you have a new technology, you take an expensive drug, it goes from 10,000 a month to 350 a month, and it's going to be better. Well, that's what new technologies do, right? Uh, it's sort of like software. All of a sudden, your computer's way faster. It does a better job, holds more memory. This is so much better than the last computer. Well, this technology is so much better than the other technology, and it's more efficient. So it's going to provide benefits in more than one area. So people have to resist the urge to say, uh, if it was that great, then everybody would be doing it. And that just means they don't know how Big Pharma works. Big Pharma revolves around money, not about therapies. So we have to keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, uh, uh, you know, remember being a young couple in our 20s and being broke all the time. You know, it's like, you, are you going to go without a prescription? Yeah, sometimes you have to. Um, and so we don't want to come up with a price that is out of somebody's reach. Everybody, low income, middle income, high income, doesn't matter. They have access to the therapy. The machine isn't that expensive to build. And we don't want to price it out of people's out of people's range. Um, so we're going to think of, you know, we're going to remember where we came from. You know, I ended up being able to put a million dollars of my money into the development of this product because I was successful as a businessman. Um, but at the same time, early in life, you know, we were in a one bedroom apartment with two kids and didn't know, um, you know, <laughs> if we could afford our prescriptions or not. Don't forget those earlier times and make sure that you include everyone. Well, that that's so nice to hear in your comparison between computers. I mean, I, I mean, I think back in the days, you know, I'm 63 and back in the days, I mean, for computers to run a company, there were rooms of computers 
you know, to hold the data and everything. And I mean, now, I mean, the amount we have just even in our phones is crazy, you know, nuts compared to, to those old days. And you're right, it, it's changed significantly. And it has made our life easier um, in, a, in a lot, a lot of ways. Um, you know, you, you talk about, you know, building this equipment. Um, can, can you describe, because it looks like it's a, a, a nasal spray, but it's, it's connected to something. So it gets um, kind of that faster spray versus just you pushing like a normal nasal spray out of a tube. Can you explain that a little bit more to us? Sure. Um, it, it, it's actually not faster. Uh, in nose to brain, what we found was slower is better. Okay. So we want people to take at least seven breaths. So it's usually time for 12 to 14 seconds because a certain amount gets to the olfactory region and a certain amount does not. So we have to make sure the right amount gets up there. This, this machine is a little bigger and it's a little easier to see. So the, for the people who will be able to see the video, um, it, it has a reservoir that's a vial and it connects to a base unit and it runs for 12 seconds and it just is a continuous flow of droplets. So you just put it in your nose and it just keeps on running while you breathe. When it shuts off, you do the other side. Um, so it's, it's, it's run by a pump, which this one will run for 12 seconds. So we'll just do a. OK, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but there is a plume coming out. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I'm trying to use a, a dark background. Yep. Uh, and it's very fine. And that's it. All right. For right there, you would have done one nostril and you just have to do that twice. You put the cap back on, the whole machine goes back in the fridge and you're done till, till the evening. Um, so it has electronics that times the device for the dose. It has the air pump, which is a thousand hour air pump. So you just have to do the math on what does a minute and a half a day come to in a thousand hours. It's going to last a lifetime, right? Um, and then you just have to just replace the reservoir um, and it just runs. You buy the device once. We're going with a razor razor blade model at commercialization because we don't want the patient to have to buy a machine twice a month. What mm -hmm. they're going to do is simply replace this reservoir that pops on and pops off. Let me get a better grip on it. Uh, so it's like that. And this is the teeny device that goes in your pocket and it just snaps back on. So when you're, when it's, when it's empty, you throw it away, you pop a new one on and, uh, that's it. That's it. It's plug and play. We know that our patients are cognitively impaired. They may be dexterously, uh, mm -hmm. impaired as well, but those things get better. It just takes a little bit of time. Uh, the insidious part of, of these kind of neurodegenerative diseases is you've had them for a decade or more before you even display a symptom. So your doctor's going to tell you, yes, you have Alzheimer's and you had it when you were 62, not 72. So we want to, we want to do early testing as early as in their forties, uh, to make sure we get it as soon as possible. But the idea that, you know, it takes such little bit of time to do, but the, there is time, you know, you're 10 years down the road in this disease. So it's not like you can instantly get back. It mm -hmm. takes time. Like it's, my father took seven months. The Parkinson's patient took nine months. Uh, and everybody is now years into this. Um, uh, on the We have 200 patients in compassionate use, which anybody can join. Um, and we have a, the clinical trial. So, um, you know, we want to hear from caregivers and patients and say, how do I get involved in this? And we'll tell you. You know, most of it is, is based around money because the FDA puts a lot of restrictions on companies like us. And it makes things more expensive. At commercialization, you're talking about a $50 unit and $25 in a vial. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a dirt cheap way of treating an untreatable disease. And it means it's accessible to everyone. Wow. Can the, can the device be used for multiple people? I'm just thinking of, again, cutting costs for people, but I'm just thinking, uh, let's say at a, in a memory care. If they wanted to, you know, get their their people in on a on a clinical trial or people there were using it, could they go with one device or is it set up specifically for dosage per person? Uh, it depends on what everybody's diagnosis is. If someone is stage two or stage three or stage four, you know, or even further down the line, 
their regimen is going to be different and their dose might be higher. In which case, you know, we may just need a, a couple of devices to do each one. But theoretically, if everybody was, was mild cognitively impaired, then they could all use the same device. But you don't want to put a, a, something up someone's nose and then put it up someone else's nose. It's not a happy place. Lots of bacteria in there. But you could get by with a single device, which is battery powered and rechargeable. Um, it runs plugged in, and all you have to do is get cartridges for everybody. They just get labeled, and you just pop the new one on, treat Betty, pop a new one on, treat Sam, and move on, right? And so everybody has their own cartridge, but everybody can use the same base unit. Um, so, yeah, that's that's uh, very possible, and we've done several studies where they want to test 60 patients, so we give them 15 devices because they're only going to do 15 at a time, and they can then autoclave, sterilize, mm -hmm and uh, go back and do the next 15. So it, it, we're actually making it cheaper on the researchers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, far less expensive than making them buy whole units for everybody uh, because we want the data. We want to be able to tell people, hey, this is what we did for ALS too. Um, and, and we're on that road. That just makes so much sense. Um, I think sometimes it takes that outside look to look at how can we do things differently so often? And I don't care what industry you're in, you kind of have the people who have always done it this way. And that's the first thing that comes out of their mouth. No, we don't need that. We've always done it this way, you know? Um, and, and that stops the whole point of creativity of exploring other avenues. And so I think sometimes it takes somebody from the outside coming in and going, you know, we're just, we believe in this. We're going to try this. I mean, we got nothing more to lose than everyone else out there playing this game, you know, but we're probably going to spend a lot less money doing it. And we're going to, we're going to do it from a different angle to boot. This is, ex this is really exciting news. Now, the other question I have is. Well, let's before we move on, if before <laughs> we move on that, that observation, it was way more insightful than you may think um, <laughs> because medicine does not do paradigm shifts very well. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of statistics that show that paradigm shifts in the industries tend to come from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying, why are you still doing it that way? But in medicine, they don't like, they're very risk averse and they don't like paradigm shifts. So it's it, it's been an uphill slog um, to get them to see that, you know, I know you do a lot of good chemistry. It's time to look at physics right now. And, uh, you know, it's slowly coming around, but, you know, uh, in, in biotech, paradigm shifts are difficult. So yeah, well, you were spot on. Yeah, well, and I, I've experienced that myself with Alzheimer's Speaks. People are like, well, what, what are you doing? What do you, what do you mean you're going to use multimedia? What do you mean you're going to let people with dementia and their family members talk, you know, because they weren't included in the conversation. And, you know, I use the example of why aren't we going directly to the people who are affected instead of peering through the window and guessing when we can actually have conversations and get real real data, you know, really meaningful. It, it, we're not, you know, we're not observing this. They're telling us this is what it's like. This is what it feels like. And, you know, for you to come in with this whole other angle in, in methodology and getting the results you're getting is, is absolutely fantastic. And it's sad that everybody doesn't know what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. And the, and the compassionate use program has given us a lot of access to patients on a day to day basis. You know, we have 200 patients we can talk mm -hmm. to at any time. But in a clinical trial that's double blind and placebo controlled, you can't talk to those patients until the thing is closed. And that mm -hmm. could be two or three years away. So you don't know you're waiting on pins and needles for them to publish their data. And we have 18 peer reviews on our success doing nose to brain mm -hmm. and our competition has zero. So I don't know why we're not the first phone call people make um, because we've already demonstrated it. But, um, you know, that's kind of why, you know, I really, really wanted to talk to you because the caregivers are just the unsung heroes of how this all works. It's unpaid, unappreciated a lot of times. It's heavily female uh, being the caregivers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, and the few males that are doing it, that number is growing, but slowly. Um, but, uh, you know, they they have to they have to be able to be more productive in their lives and not just take care of someone with dementia. It's a two hundred fifty billion dollar productivity loss every year for caring for a dementia patient uh, as a relative. Right. So mm -hmm. as a caregiver, uh, why we want to be able to hand their lives back to them. 
Um, that's why we want to appeal to the caregivers to come help us out. Um, and the patients themselves, would you like to be part of a, a, a clinical trial that will change how this is all done? Um, uh, but, you know, uh, we get to talk to the caregivers every day. And having access to the patient is also great because they get to tell us what design aspects they don't like. Right. Yep. An engineer develops something that he thinks is awesome, and it is, but it has this little niggling problem that a patient really doesn't like. And so we are able to adjust that. And, it, and a lot of times that's adjusted by what drug we're delivering. And so it needs to be completely different for a particular subset of patients. All of that gives us real time data. So you're you're absolutely right. We love having access to the caregivers and the patients. We have learned way more in the last, you know, 10 years of compassionate use than we did in a whole bunch of clinical trials, simply because the patient populations are small and uh, it, the process is so slow. So when you say compassionate use, can you explain that to our audience a little bit more? Who would qualify for compassionate use? Pretty much anybody who has dementia. Um, you know, it, it's it, what what may not resonate with with some patients simply because it's it's not really well known is that um, we're treating mild cognitive impairment in seven different categories right so alzheimer's is just the biggest category mm -hmm. then there's parkinson's but each a lot of these disease states that have other problems have as a, have as a, a, a coexisting condition mm -hmm. uh symptom of cognitive impairment so Parkinson's patients have tremors and physical issues, but they also have cognitive impairment. Multiple sclerosis, same thing. Um, so we're doing, you know, HIV patients who are taking heavy doses also have cognitive impairment. We're treating them. So there's aging African-Americans we're running because they tend to have higher diabetes problems and they get it younger. So we want to take that subset and do it. But mild cognitive impairment is mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and we have a, a compassionate use program that has taken Lewy body dementia patients who could were nonverbal. Uh, the only time they ever made a sound was when they were hallucinating. Mm -hmm. They were wheelchair bound and they walk and talk now. Um, it, it was just a tremendous thing to watch happen. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, access to the patients and, and being able to talk to them every day um, really moved the company down the road. Uh, uh, in a manner that we couldn't do. And all they have to do, if somebody wants to get involved in compassionate use, they just have to contact us. There's money involved because the, the device is expensive at this time uh, because the FDA says you can't build any until somebody asks you to. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have to build it, qualify it, run it through quality control, and then get it in their hands. Then we have to support it uh, for the life of the patient. So that comes with a cost. And uh, but anybody can get involved. Uh, but at the same time, if they were to invest in Curve, they could be invited to join a clinical trial. And, you know, we can get to that when when you're ready. But, you know, we are calling we are calling for uh, caregivers and patients to participate in this in this process. We need twenty five million dollars to run the clinical trial that will get us on the market. We have to go raise that. Um, and we've always done well on a grassroots level. Caregivers um and patients are saying this should be in everybody's hands and all we want to do is make your life better so if you wanted to get part of the compassionate use program you can buy in if you want to be part of a uh, clinical trial contact us um and, and we'll figure it out one thing to be to be um uh, also clear about is we're not doing centralized clinical trials so you don't have to live near a place where it's going to be run we're going to be decentralized among all 50 states, so that if you lived in some small town in North Dakota, you still can be part of the clinical trial. You don't have to be near Boston where Harvard's going to run some for us. You know, we're not saying that they are. We're just saying that as an mm -hmm. example um, that, you know, uh, and a lot of people will call it and say, we live in rural Georgia. There's no way we can participate in a clinical trial. And that's not so anymore. Decentralized trials are great. And so we want to make sure that we're inclusive of uh, of everyone, just like we are with cost. Wow. And that has been a huge problem I've heard from so many trials is how do we get people because they, they have to be around us, they have to be clustered around us or willing to travel to us and, and meet those needs. I mean, that takes a that takes a big wedge out of out of that whole um, process of, of pulling people in. But again, it's the messaging, it's getting it out to people. Now, people might be a little bit confused because you've got clinical trials, but then it sounds like people can um, 
even though it's not FDA approved, FDA has some rules about how people can participate if they want to buy in through this compassionate use or be a, a um, part of a clinical trial. Can you really describe the differences there? Because, you know, people are always worried about getting scammed and is this really real and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, that is such a good question, because we get this all the time, right? We're telling people what we're doing. And, you know, we don't want to sound like some internet quack therapy mm -hmm. that someone is pushing for Alzheimer's, because, you know, they're just criminals taking advantage of desperate people. Mm -hmm. um, so the difference between us and other things that you're going to find is the FDA has been in control of our clinical trials all along. It's what's called an ethical clinical trial. We're an ethical pharmaceutical company, an ethical drug device delivery company. So, um, you know, we've done everything under the auspices and under the strictures of the FDA. So, you know, when we say we have 18 peer reviews, all the internet quack therapies don't have a single one. And they say clinically tested does not mean it was under the FDA. It mm -hmm. just means they went into a clinic and tested whatever they wanted to test. And whatever came out good is the one they tell you about, right? So it's not, it's not apples and apples. Um, so it has to be clinically tested under FDA guidelines. And that's where you separate uh, those therapies from ours. Um, and our, our, all of our peer reviews are in the public domain. People can do, and they're also on our website. So, you know, anybody can go in and read anytime they want. Um, you know, peer reviews are written by PhDs for PhDs. So do your best. Not an easy there. read <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> for the normal person. <laughs> Exactly. And we don't even get all of it. And we work with these people, right? It's, um, uh, you know, they use language that we don't get. The, 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 the other side of that coin is when we talk physics and fluid dynamics to these people, they don't get us either. So it makes, it makes us a really good team. You come up with a formulation that will have an impact on the disease. We'll get it to where it needs to go. Um, so that's the, and the compassionate use program was a right to try, right? There's a, mm -hmm. there's technology out there that has been proven to be safe. We have not had a single adverse event in 22 clinical trials and thousands of patients because we're so efficient. Um, um, but the compassionate use program guarantees you're not going to be on a placebo. The clinical trial means you might, um, at the end of the trial, you get to keep the device because it's going to be a phase three. And that's where the compassionate use program was born in a phase two trial the patients got better and legally we have to take the devices back and they didn't want to give them up so we had a lot of patients that were in a trial that felt so much better calling us up and saying how do i get involved in this how do i get my device back and you know we came up with the program all we need is a neurologist or a doctor to prescribe it and you get the right to try it mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just a matter of reaching out to info at Curve Tech, uh, not Curve Tech, info at CurveTX.com. We'll want to edit that out because we're Curve Therapeutics, not Curve Technology. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they can go and get involved in uh, at, you know, Curve TX. Remember that Curve is spelled with a K, K-U-R-V-E-T-X.com. And if they can, uh, all they have to do is inquire. Info at CurveTX.com is our is the email. If you're interested, let us know. If you're interested in investing, let us know. But if we can't count on our caregivers and our patients to help us get to the goal of raising the money, then, you know, I don't know how we're going to get there. Um, we've come, we've done three out of four required studies. They're so safe. It is non-invasive. It's either going to help or it's not going to do anything. But we've had only four patients that got nothing out of the thousands that we've tested. Even the control groups got better. So, um, there's just so much opportunity here. And an investor in, in Curve TX does not, is not limited to Alzheimer's, right? So if you're a caregiver or a patient in Alzheimer's, know that you're going to make money from Parkinson's and ALS and autism and PTSD and everything else because you're investing in the company, not the therapy. Um, so it depends on what your motivations are. Okay. And that information is on the website for them to learn more on how to, how to participate that, in that if they want to be an investor? Exactly. There's an invest now button on the, on the landing page. It takes three minutes to go through it. Um, you can buy as few as a hundred shares. So that's $580. So for under 600 bucks, you can own, own a piece of the company and actually help the end game. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the higher levels, you get, you know, bonus shares and 
invitations to clinical trials. Um, that cutoff is five thousand dollars. So if you if you want to invest five thousand, then you will get an invitation for your person or yourself or your patient um, to be invited to a clinical trial that will be decentralized. So it's really up to the um, uh, individual and the individual's caregivers to decide how they want to participate. But uh, I, I can say that right now, uh, without a grassroots movement, I'm not sure we get there. But that's, you know, uh, if we can't appeal to the people that we work with and interact with every day, um, there's no one we can appeal to. Uh, venture capital doesn't like the fact that Big Pharma hasn't bought in yet. Big Pharma doesn't like the fact that we don't have a giant venture capitalist who's raped us already. Um, so, uh, you know, we're kind of we're, we're kind of taking the every man and saying, help us get there. Well, it's it, it's funny and sad at the same time, because you're just stuck in the middle of these two major entities that have always done things a certain way. And they they won't look outside those boxes. I mean, it's like you, you fit this criteria or you don't. And the piece that they're forgetting, it's that it's the creativity that that moves the mountain you know it's everything that they stand for and do is because it's a creative moment but they've gotten themselves so pinned into a set way that it that it has to rule um, which is so sad and I think I think right now we're living in an era which I never thought I'd see where you know all of all of our systems seem to be crumbling and the grassroots is standing up and going, there's got to be a better way. And they're taken to marching and protesting and donating and doing all different types of things. But, you know, are just saying enough is enough. Things, things have to change and there's no reason that they can't. But we got to get out okay. of that box. Indeed, indeed. And, and to, to put a fine point on that, uh, there's an unfortunate story where a big pharma company in Europe called us up and said, we want to do something nose to brain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I asked them, I said, you know, we're using one of your drugs over the counter to treat some things we're doing. Um, why wouldn't you support us? And the guy was quiet for about a minute. And I thought I had lost the connection. <laughs> and what was happening was he was choking up and he was trying to talk. And what he said was, Mark, I spent three years trying to talk upper management into working with you, and they were really receptive at first. And the first question they asked was, how much of this are we going to sell? Mm -hmm. And because the dose is low but has a great effect, they went, oh, oh well, thanks for coming. Um, it wasn't enough drugs sold to support it. So that was just appalling. Um, you know, I, I, so I asked them, I said, why don't you just do it for the PR? Everybody thinks you're cold blooded and, and you don't care about anybody. Say, look, we're not going to make a ton of money on this, but it helps people. So we're going to do it. And they said, I could never sell that upstairs. Um, which is so sad because you look at the numbers of people that are diagnosed, which in my estimation, and you know, I, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a clinician in any shape or form, or even an academia. The numbers are low. There's a lot of people out there that are struggling with these symptoms that have not gotten diagnosed, that will not get diagnosed. And, you know, maybe it's not price big, but you can make things up in, in like you said, in quantity. Plus, you can improve people's lives. You can build a better image. I mean, there's so many pluses to that. And it's sad. It really, it's past sad. It's sick that it's not being considered. I'll, I'll just lay it out there. Cause I think if their family could be next to be touched by this and to not want to, and they will call me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it, again, it's, it, it, we're, we're, we've just gotten into such a backward society. Um, you know, healthcare should be about helping people live healthy lives. It should be about prevention. It should be, you know, not waiting until it's gotten so bad, we can't fix it. Um, and simplicity there, to me, that's one of the things I found in this area too. Um, when I joined in is everybody was pitching complicated things. Everybody was pitching the doom and the gloom. And you're talking about hope and hope sticks around doom and gloom takes off after the journey's over. 
okay, I don't have to deal with my folks anymore. You know, they've passed away or whatever, you know, or their friend or whoever it might be. Most people don't stick around in a doom, doom and gloom scenario, but they do stick around for hope and they want to be part of that machine that makes lives better so that somebody else doesn't have to go through what they went through. And I really, um, I really think they're off the mark with this one um, and need to get on the mark with you, you know, in terms of, of trying something different. You know, we have, we have failed so horribly for so long on this disease and um, you know, it's, it, to me, it's just absolutely ridiculous. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens um, in the future. Now, if you could say one thing to um, a person who is diagnosed or presenting symptoms and their care, care team, what would that message be to them? The message to them, I would say, is, is something that I say a lot, and that is time is not your friend. Mm -hmm. um, it's a progressive disease. If they get diagnosed, it means they've had it for a decade. <clears throat> you have to uh, get started on this right away. We've had people take two years to make up their mind to join the compassionate use program. Meanwhile, the patient now has gone two mm -hmm. stages down. Um, so early diagnosis and early treatments are the key. But with as with that Louis body dementia patient who couldn't walk or talk, mm -hmm. it's not a lost cause because they're pretty far down the road. We're still able to regain some ground. And if only thing we do is really significantly slow the progression, then we have patients who would age in place. They don't need as much um, support. They don't need daily support. They can feed themselves, bathe themselves. They can still watch TV, remember at the end of a show, what happened in the beginning. And that was one of the things that, you know, our patients tell us a lot is that I can read a book again because I can remember what happened three chapters ago and I can watch a movie that's two and a half hours long and remember the beginning at the end. Um, so these are the real life quality of life changes that, you know, people get to, it gets experienced fairly quickly, especially the attention span, short-term memory, and the verbal fluency, the things that are just frustrating on a daily basis, you know. Um, you don't forget that your glasses are on your head anymore, um, so you're not searching for them. Uh, you know, it's... I do that so often, I can't even tell you. Sometimes I have two pair up there. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, if I'm going to tell a caregiver team, a lot of times people find us because they say, my okay. dad's been diagnosed and I don't know what to do. So we're going to get on the Internet and do a bunch of research. And that's how they find us. Mm -hmm. um, and they reach out and say, how do we do this? What, what's the next steps? And it depends what they have. Could be Parkinson's, could be uh, Alzheimer's, uh, could be mild cognitive, cognitive impairment in a different uh, you know, flavor of dementia. Um, but we have answers for these things. Um, you know, if, if you need drugs in getting into the brain past the blood brain barrier, wear your ticket there. Um, so call soon. All right. Talk to your doctor. Neurologists are, as a group, extremely open minded. Right. So if you take things like Namenda and Aricept for Alzheimer's, it's good for three to six months and anybody stops tolerating it and you basically are taken off of it. Um, so six months in, you've got nothing. Um, three months potentially. Uh, with us, you know, you 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 have ten, the next 10, 15 years to try and make an impact with it. Uh, so time is not your friend. Call us immediately. Uh, get involved, um, and, and we can help. If we don't, you don't have to wait. You know, six years for the trial to get run. We can we can start doing some things for it today. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done anything with uh, kids with eight, or, and adults with ADHD? I was just thinking when you were talking about that attention span and stuff, that would be really interesting to see. Um, yeah, we've done a little bit, and there's some spillover into that from our autism study, um, which I think could be possible. But, um, you know, when you look at what the neurodegenerative disease market is, there's more than 400 of them, right? Now, because there's so many, a lot of them are orphans. And orphan products do not get a lot of big pharma support, right? Because there's just not enough patients. Um, so what, you know, we're, we're tackling the big ones now because the, that's the lowest hanging fruit. But, you know, we're planning on going after ADHD and autism and all the other things that we're doing. But we are going to do maybe four or five products as curve, right? Mm -hmm. 
but there's hundreds of them. We can't do them all. So we want pharma companies to participate with us so we can do them in parallel and, and, and advance the entire industry forward at the same time. We're actually willing to compete with ourselves. We have our own drug we're going to do, but somebody else comes with another drug for Alzheimer's that, or a different cognitive impairment um, disease state, and we will then partner with them. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that if you're going to deliver it to the brain, we want to be the ones who do it for you. Mm -hmm. And all, the only important thing at the end of the day is, is, is the patient getting a benefit? If mm -hmm. they're not, you stop. If they are, then you continue. Um, it's it's short-sighted, in my opinion, to say every opportunity you have to maximize your dollar yield out of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's there's, Life's too short for that. Um, get as many going as you can. Exactly. Now, you guys have launched a, something called a Regulation A offering. Can you t explain to us what that means? Sure. Um, this was started fairly recently. It was done um, a couple of presidential administrations ago as an alternative to venture capital and private equity. Um, if they get involved in you, they, a lot of times they want to give you money, but they want to take over. And you have to then count on them being successful with what you were trying to do with your vision. And your visions may not align after the money arrives. Um, so is there an opportunity to raise large amounts of capital from accredited and unaccredited investors like a caregiver? Um, if you can only afford $600 on your credit card, you can still be a part of it, right? So it's, it's really an opportunity to get uh, sort of an unlimited number of investors to participate you know, on a small and or large level. And we can do what's called regulation D, which is what venture capital and private equity normally do at the same time. So if somebody wants to come in and write a $25 million check, they're not going to do that under reg A, they'll do that mm -hmm. under reg D. But the reg A plus is for, you know, uh, individuals who want to get involved in investing and, uh, you know, wouldn't qualify for the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Um, you know, but we will, uh, be good custodians of your investment because we're actually low risk at this point. In the beginning, we're doing nose to brain. Nobody would touch us with a 10 foot pole. We had nobody, nobody had any idea how the FDA was going to react. Are they going to make you do phase 10 just to make mm -hmm. sure that the brain's okay? Or are they going to just say, we need to fast track this? Turns mm -hmm. out they want to fast track it. So we got lucky. Um, and we have a great relationship with the FDA. Um, so the regulation A plus is so that we can get enough investment to run the phase three without venture capital and or with it, but we can do it the way we want to do it. Make sure the caregivers remain the focus and the patients remain the focus. And that's how, that's how we operate. So we're hoping that your listeners will call and okay. go to the website and invest. Wonderful. Well, this is, this has just been a fascinating conversation, Mark. Um, is there anything that um, I haven't asked you that you think um, my audience needs to know about? Um, no, I think you did really well uh, getting to the meat of what we do. I just would reinforce that, you know, this is not an internet quack therapy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if this is something that's being done uh, through federal clinical trials, and so you can count on it. And so the fact that we have seven trials running with the same device, same drug, same dose, tells you how safe it is. Mm -hmm. No adverse events and lots of success. And, and that's documented. So um, you know, come visit us. If, if you just have a conversation, oh, there's one thing I would like to say, and that is we have several patients who are dying to be called. Mm -hmm. If, you know, their caregivers or the patient themselves, we can't inundate them with a thousand calls. But if someone would like to talk to a patient who's used it and had a benefit, um, there's a lot of people who are volunteering to take those calls um, and tell them what their experience was. So you don't have to just listen to me because I'm going to tell you we're awesome. Uh, listen to someone who's actually used it and benefited from it and let them tell you we're awesome. Uh, so that I'm sounds, always going to tell you we're awesome. <laughs> that sounds like a whole nother show to me, you know, if we could line them up and be able to, to hear those voices, that could be really, um, really, really powerful. Cause I think that is one of the things that's scary about getting involved with trials and so many people, you know, go through this process and they think they're going to be part of it and then they get kicked out at the last minute. And, and I'm sure your trials have criteria as well with all of that. How do you step people through um, being part of a clinical trial? Do, is it something they sign up for? Do they talk, you know, on the computer or do they meet with somebody or talk with them? Um, yeah, the, the protocol, you know, has pretty much been written 
Um, but we haven't submitted it to the FDA yet because we don't want to waste their time if we don't have the funding to actually do it. However, uh, you know, we did submit the protocol and they did accept it. Mm-hmm. So we we already know what we need to do. Um, and but so we'll be able to to step forward with it. But the if they want to get involved in it, there's going to be a company that manages their input, their intake of information, where they live. Like I said, it's decentralized, so it won't matter, but there are logistics to it uh, that are solvable. So you know, we're just going to do a lot of things on telemedicine. You don't have to go anywhere, but you will have to have some blood work done uh, at some point with someone. Uh, mm-hmm. it, so it's not really all that critical. The, cr- the protocol criteria will be published at some point, um, but, you know, we're not – we can't. We can't set that until the funding is available. So, um, okay. but if somebody's interested, they can call us. We can tell them what, what it is we're looking to do, and whether or not they'll qualify. Um, and we're not gonna we're not going to you know say you're not going to be in. Um, you can be in this study or the or, or this parallel study because of your condition. Uh, but we're we're really not we're really hoping not to exclude a ton of people. Some will have to. Uh, that's just the way things are done. Okay. So right now, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear in my own mind. There's not an open clinical trial that they can participate in. You're it, you're just getting ready for the next one. That's correct. We are raising okay. the money to do the next one. Right. Okay. And that is that- use is ongoing. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and what level is this one? I know they rate them like one, two, three um, for trials. What what would this one be? This is a phase three, a phase three. And that's the final, final phase. Okay. I, I just, I want to make sure I'm, I'm making sense uh, in, in a no, you got it. with what yeah. you're, with what you're saying. Well, uh, Mark, Drew, this has been just wonderful. I am, I am so glad that our, our friend uh, Suzanne Newman with answers for elders uh, connected us because I, I just find this fascinating what you're doing with, with curve therapeutics. I hope our listeners will like, click, and share this and become a giver of hope. You know, spread the word of what's possible out there. We never know who's dealing with this because not everybody feels comfortable talking about uh, this kind of stuff. And the more information we can we can push out to people, the more options we give them, um, the less stress and burden they're going to feel. And to me, when I was a when I was caring for my mom, that made all the difference in the world. And so, you know, if we enlighten people's burdens, you know, let's do that. Again, you can go to their website, which is Curve with a K, K U R V E, and then TX.com. They're also on Facebook as uh, Curve Therapeutics, on LinkedIn as Curve Therapeutics Inc., and on Twitter as Curve TX. Thanks again, Mark, for your time. Really appreciate it today. Oh, Laurie, it was wonderful. And you have such a great platform. Uh, Thank you for having us. I had patients who wanted to be on this call. And I told (laughs) them, let's do one. Mm -hmm. uh, And then then we'll bring in the next one so that there's at least some groundwork has been laid. So yeah, anytime we want to do another one of these, I have uh, any number of people who would volunteer to answer your questions. Oh, I think that would be absolutely fantastic. You know, to hear, hear from people who have actually used, you know, the therapy and what a difference it's made in their life. Uh, there's, like you said, there's nothing better than someone else talking about the work that you're doing. <laughs> that- and hope, hope will, will lower your anxiety level as well. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. You, yeah. Oh, definitely. That makes that makes a huge difference. Um, to our audience again, thank you so much uh, for being part of our community. Uh, feel free to check out alzheimerspeaks.com and all of our free resources that we have there. And also check out Dementia Map, which is our global resource directory. Both of those are dot coms with their names, so easy to find. We'll talk soon, everybody. Bye now. Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.